So we're going to be talking today about miracles. And this is a part two message of last week's uh, message on miracles and what God is trying to encourage us with and how to receive miracles, how to look for them, how to seek after them. And what we went through last week was this, is that you can break down, um, and I'm talking about from years of experience, but I would say that there's three main categories that people seek after God for in the area of prayer, faith, and miracles, and that would be relationships, finances, and health. Relationships, finances, and health. We all deal with relationships. We all deal with financial uh, uh, finances just in general on a daily basis, and we all are concerned with and deal with health. Amen? You, like, an example of the health part is how many of you guys know when you're doing good and then you know when you're doing bad? Have you ever had with someone who's a, you know, you're about to eat and they're like, oh, no, I can't have that because I've been bad this week. I say, it seems like I say that all the time, you know, but, <laughs> but, but you know, so we're concerned about health. We, we have to, you know, take care of our temple. We have to deal with our finances properly. We, we want to build healthy relationships. But sometimes, listen, life happens. And things happen in our life, things that you didn't expect. And, and I, I can guarantee you that, that 10 out of 10 people that were at the altar never planned when they were doing their vows to know that years later they, they were going to be divorced. They didn't plan on their spouse cheating on them. They didn't plan on financial hardship happening. You know, I've shared my testimony times. I didn't plan on the on the stock stock market crashing and 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 you know junk junk bonds in in, in the form of real estate you know uh, uh, crashing and all that. Which my wife and I lost everything. You know, I didn't plan on that. You know, I didn't I didn't that affected you know our finances. That'll affect your health. You know, you didn't plan on some things like, wait a minute, I run, I eat healthy and stuff like that. Why are they diagnosing me with this? But can I tell you that Jesus is always there? And, and, and I want to say this to you. Jesus is much more than just a comforter. Jesus is a miracle worker. He's not just someone you can put your shoulder on or lean on his bosom. Jesus also does miracles. And so the question that we, we want to ask ourselves, why are miracles not as prevalent anymore? Why are miracles not prevalent? Why is it that we don't see them the way Jesus, you know, walked it out in the Bible? Or can I just say this to you just to be honest with you? Why is it that we don't see miracles in America compared to other countries that are seeing them on a crazy level? Like it's a, it's a part of normal Christianity, but why for us, and I'm talking about in general as a whole, in America, why is that not prevalent? Why is that not something that's part of Christian culture? We know love is part of Christian culture. We know, of course, anything related to the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, is, is part of Christian culture. That's the foundation, you know, relationships, um, healthy marriages. And you start talking about Christianity, and you can pull out some things that people want to talk about, but it seems like not many people want to talk about miracles. Because the thing is this, the main question of why miracles aren't prevalent, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit there and put pastors a little bit on blast, because what if it doesn't happen? That's the main reason we don't seek after some things. Why, what if it doesn't happen? And that's not the question you need to be asking. The question is, what if it does? What if it does? That's the question. So <clears throat> I want to talk to you a, a, a couple of things on, on why I believe. I mentioned a couple of these, and I'm going to rattle them off to you. But first of all, the world, it, people's lives, the whole world is centered around themselves. Everything is I this, I that, iPad, iMac, iPhone, me, I, I, I. Everything is centered around ourselves. Listen, we're so dependent on self. Um, I told you last week, I look up, looked up the mission statements of Google, Amazon, and Apple, and everything related to the, their vision statements and mission statements was about getting something to you quickly, uh, information for you to get it as fast as possible. It's all about you, the consumer. Well, let me tell you, in God's kingdom, it's all about him. And when you put him at the head and when you put him first, it's amazing what God will do when you take you out of the equation. Amen? 
I and you, those two letters in the kingdom are not that great. But when it's all about him, that's when God begins to move so powerfully. Uh, there, there's an there's a atmosphere of no God consciousness. You know, we, we, we don't set our lives in the area of being conscious of God in our everyday lives, where we, where we look for God, where we try to sense God, where we try to, to, to go after God. You know, uh, it, there's, a, there's a lack of God consciousness. Now, listen. I know a lot of great people in this place. That is not your life. So I'm not saying that. I'm not prophetically speaking that over you. Remember, I'm being general. There's a lack of God consciousness. I remember the, uh, uh, Pastor Raphael, a dear friend of Joanne and I's. I've done many missions trips in the Dominican Republic. He's a, uh, just a, a national pastor in that country, speaks to the president and does all this stuff. And he's just a, just, man, you know, he's just a beautiful guy. He won't let me stay in a hotel when I go there. I stay in his house. And he's got like 12 different churches throughout Santo Domingo and, and, and all this stuff. So we go in this. And so um, he helped found a church in a, in a city called La Cienega. And La Cienega is way up in the mountains. You have to go up two hours into mountains where there's like no one around. And then when you pass all these mountains in this rough terrain, there's this little city. And a friend of our, uh, Deborah Cusick, actually was one of the first missionaries to go in there, and she planted the first Christian church. And this is only like in the late 90s. She planted this church. They found a pastor. They began evangelizing to to because because um, up to that point it was only Catholic, and then there was like uh, maybe another group, but there was no Christian, uh, no Christian groups there. And so anyway, so we did a lot of missions trips. I've spoken in La Cienega, stayed there many a time, and uh, and and so I asked Pastor Rafael the last time I talked to him. I said, I said, hey. I said, let me ask you something. I said, um, how's Pastor Pedro doing? So Pastor Pedro was, is, was the pastor in La Cienega. I said, oh, he's doing good. And, um, and I, said, I said, hey, I said, did they ever get electricity? Because I'm talking to you guys. Like, this is way in the mountains where, where when we went to visit people at their houses to pray for them, they're, 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 like when they were eating dinner, their light was functioning by a car battery. So they had cables hooked up to a, just a, a light to a, to a car battery, and that was their electricity. And everything else was gas-related, like, you know, petroleum tanks to cook their food. And so, so I asked him, I said, I said, hey, did they get electricity? He goes, yeah, they did. I said, oh, that's awesome. And he goes, well, not really. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He says, well, he says, ever since they got electricity, he goes, church attendance and church growth has declined in the whole city. And I said, why? And he says, people started watching TV. And I, I'm talking about this is only like five years ago. I'm just being, this is only five to six years ago. He says, people started watching television. And he goes, they're not coming to church as much. Completely distracted. From how much more us with, with the whole world is in the palm of our hand or in our pocket? Come on now. And now even our watches, you know? So, so there's a lot of distraction. But listen, we want to talk about what moves the hand of God. I want, to, I want to read this story to you. This is such an amazing story in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Luke 19, 1 to 10. And if you have your Bible or if you have your Bible app, you can go to Luke chapter 19. And we're going to read verses 1 to 10. And we're going to read a very familiar story about a man named Zacchaeus. And in verse 1, it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Listen, all the people saw this and began to mutter, which means to complain. It says he has, talking about Jesus, he has gone to be the guest of a what? Of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, 
here and now. I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Come on now. And I want to bring you back to verse 3. Verse 3 says Zacchaeus, it says he wanted to see who Jesus was, but, everyone say but. Because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. And I want to say this to you, that everyone has a but in this place, literally and physically. Everyone has a but. But this, but I was born into the wrong family, but I don't like who I am, but I'm too short, but I'm too fat, but I'm too tall, but I'm too skinny, but I'm, but I'm this, 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 and this. We all have buts. But Zacchaeus did something about his but in reference to God. Come on now. Have you ever talked to someone and said, hey, man, why don't you give your life to Jesus? Or, hey, girl, it's time to start serving Jesus. And they say, yeah, but I'm not ready. Yeah, but I have to sow my wild oats. Yeah, but I haven't partied enough. But, you know, there'll come a day where I will go ahead and serve Jesus. Let me tell you the devil's favorite word. You know what his favorite word is? His favorite word is tomorrow. That's his favorite word. He loves that word because if he can get you to say tomorrow enough, one day there won't be a tomorrow, and then it's too late. So the thing is this, is that Zacchaeus did something about his butt. He was short, but he needed to go after God. He wanted to see Jesus. So what does he do? He climbs a tree. He went the extra mile to see Jesus. Come on now. Stick with me. He went the extra mile to see Jesus. And Jesus was walking by, and he says, Zacchaeus, look, Jesus looks up. Come on now. There's a whole lot of people on this level. There's a whole lot of people. This is where the crowd is, right, Manny? Manny, the crowd is right here. But Jesus had to look up and say, hey, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house for dinner. And while they were at dinner, while they were at Zacchaeus' house, all these people saying, look at Jesus hanging out with a sinner. But Zacchaeus, because Jesus recognized him, loved on him, he said this. He said, I'm going to give half my stuff to the poor. And if I wronged anyone, I'm going to give him four times the amount of what, I did, uh, of what I did to them. He was a tax collector. Those were some greedy, evil people in those days. That's what they were known for. Let me ask you something. When Zacchaeus did that, what, if you were to take one word to describe what he did, what is that called? Anybody? Repentance. Repentance. He repented. When you repent and you come to God and you repent, that's when God begins to move. Listen, had Zacchaeus not climbed the tree... Jesus wouldn't have asked him to come wouldn't have asked him to come down and say I'm going to your house. Come on now. Just an easy biblical principle, but I want but I want to say this to you the goodness of Jesus overshadowed the the darkness that was in Zacchaeus' life. The goodness of God overshadowed that. Zac, remember when Jesus asked Zacchaeus to say come down and I'm going to your house, I just want to remind you he had not repented yet, but it was the goodness of God to love on Zacchaeus, to cause him to recognize, hey, come down, I'm going to eat with you. Amen? Let's go to Luke chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. Luke chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. I love, love, love this story. Amen? And you should too because it's really, really powerful. Luke chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. I'm going to be reading out of the NIV version. And it says this in verse 17. One day, Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Hallelujah. Everyone say hallelujah. hallelujah. The power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, 
they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their what? Come on, when Jesus saw their what? When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Verse 24, skip to verse 24 real quick. But I want you to know that the Son of Man, Jesus is speaking here, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Come on now. What was the act of faith that this paralyzed man's friends did? What did they do? What did they do? They climbed a roof, broke open a hole in the roof, and lowered the man down in front of Jesus. Come on now, this is so good. Listen, first of all is this, they had to lower him down to where Jesus was. See, you got to go where Jesus is. If you want a miracle, you're going to have to go where Jesus is. You're going to have to go. Listen, if you want a miracle, don't talk to a doubter. Talk to someone with faith. If you're going to talk to someone, don't talk to someone who doesn't believe that God is a supernatural God. Talk to someone who bleeds and oozes that God is a supernatural, miraculous God, that he's able to do anything if you set your faith to it. That's who you want to talk to. Let me ask you something. When was the last time you broke open the roof for anybody in your life? When was the last time you took somebody and said, you know what? I'm going to take you to a place you've never been before. The crowd is blocking us from getting to where we want to go. Listen, the crowd will block you from where you want to go. The crowd will block you to where you need to go. The crowd will block you from your miracle. But it's going to take somebody to climb and get up and say, you know what? I want to see Jesus. So Zacchaeus climbed the tree. It's going to take someone to climb and say, you know what? We're going to climb you. We're going to take you because we know where Jesus is. And we're not going to take you sort of close to Jesus. We're going to put you right in front of Jesus. We're going to lower you right into his presence. We're going to break open some tiles. We're going to break open the roof. Do you know that there's no ceiling on God? The minute you put Jesus in a box, the minute you put a ceiling on God, you are limited. And guess what? He is limited because he's moved by your faith. He is not moved. Listen, and I want to tell you this. You better hope if you want to play that whole grace card thing, you better hope. That everything that people are saying on the TV is true. Because I will tell you this. This is one thing I know. God still believes in holiness. God still believes in purity. God still believes that sin is sin even if everybody is doing it. It doesn't matter. Your standard is not the world. Your standard is the Bible. Right is right, even if no one is doing it. And wrong is wrong, even if everyone is doing it. It's still wrong. Because our standard is the word. And I said that to say to you is this, is that it's time to go higher. It's time for all of us to go higher. We need to be a Zacchaeus. We need to be like those friends and climb so that we can see what God is doing. It's time to take the roof off. Don't put God in a box. He is moved by your faith. I brought up that whole point about sin because I want to tell you something. It's not about how godly you are either. It's about do you have faith to believe that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? And here's the thing. It's so easy to get comfortable in the middle of where you are. Can I tell you something? Just be 100% real, and I'm not going to be much longer. We're going we're to fellowship together. But I want to tell you this. 
My, listen, I'm preaching to you. I have greater faith. I don't know why this is. I don't, this seems to be the norm in preachers' lives. I have way greater faith for your miracle than I do my own. I do. I do. To believe for you is so easy. But when you're going through it, what do you do? You know what I do? I call some people. I'm like, I need prayer today. I need a breakthrough today. And depending on what I need prayer for is dependent on who I call. Because there's some people that, listen, there's some people that have experienced some things and it's no problem for them to believe for you in that area. And there's other people in some other areas that, you know what, they have received financial breakthrough and for them, it's like nothing. To have faith. Some people can easily have faith for you in the area of finances. Some can do it in the area of relationships. You know, there's people here that their marriage has been restored because they said, Jesus, we need you. We're about to get divorced. And you know what? Jesus came in. You know, so those people are the ones you talk to to restore and bring health to your relationship because they've seen the hand of God in the area of health. Listen, anything related to healing, I'm telling you right now, you can come and ask me because I have faith for healing. I have experienced the supernatural touch of God. Supernatural. Because it's either I couldn't walk and 30 seconds later, I could walk. You see what I'm saying? And what was the difference? Some little lady who put her hands on my back and began to whisper a prayer. Healing is real. It's either that or I'm a liar or I'm crazy or, you know, maybe, maybe I was thinking something. Maybe something happened. I don't know. Maybe I don't know what I, you know. no, man, it was Jesus. It was Jesus. Listen, let me, let me, let me just say this to you. And you guys have heard me tell this story. So I'm going to do it from, no, I'm not going to do it from up there because I don't want to get the feedback. No, that's cool. I'll do it right here. Listen. <clears throat> So we're, we're in the, the, today's Dominican Republic Day stories, okay? So listen, so I'm in the Dominican Republic. We are in the middle of on our way to La Cienega. So where Santo Domingo's down here, in the mountains high up is, is uh, La Cienega. And so in the middle is this little town. It's like the last stop before you have to do a lot of stuff. Like we used to have to take Jeeps because there was really no road, okay? So... So there's this restaurant, and it sits on a fast, winding river. And the boulders that are around that river, I'm, I'm not exaggerating to you. The, so if this, is, if this is what you can see, if this is the water down here, the boulders are as high as where those lights are right there, those, those bulbs that are hanging. That's how big the boulders are. So, so we're sitting there, and so, you know, what, you know this, we're going to go swimming. We're going to go in, in the stream, you know, and so that's what we're going to do. We had a team with us of about 20, so it was awesome. So, you know, and so, but listen, so we see some local kids. I am going to do it from up here. I'm going to do it from up here. I'm going to do it from up here. So I see some, I see some, I see some local kids, and so we're on top of one of the big boulders, right? So we see some, these little jits come next to us, and they just look at me, and they look down, and they jump in the middle of rocks. Like, they, there's boulders all around, and they jump in this hole. And I'm like, oh, my, this dude just committed suicide. Like, I sw I'm telling you, I said, this, this dude just killed himself. We're like, oh, my God. And all of, we're looking down because the river, it's flowing like this, shoo, fast. And then here comes another little kid, and he just looks at us, and he smiles, and he goes like this. Jumps right, in the, jumps right in the thing, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm like, this is insanity. And what do I see? I look down the stream, and they popped up down there. Now, I thought they were floating bodies, you know what I'm saying, because they jumped in the middle of rocks. And so here's what the kid says to me. He says, jump. And I'm like, dude, I'm not jumping. And he says to me, he, no, but he said to me, he goes, jump. He says, I promise he said, nothing's going to happen to you. And I said, bro, I said, you're 60 pounds. I'm 200 pounds. Well, I was 200 pounds at the day. I'm a little over that now. But, I'm saying, but I, was, I said, I'm 200 pounds. You're 60 pounds. He goes, nothing's going to happen to you. 
And so in that moment, because I just love stuff like that anyway, I just said, you know what? I said, I'm going to trust him. And I jumped. I was the first one on our team to jump. And I jumped. And I don't remember what happened underneath. Like, because I knew I was twirling around. Because I'm thinking, I'm going to I'm gonna hit my head on rocks. I'm going to get scraped up. I'm going to be all jacked up, go back to the U.S., all messed up. And here I am. I pop up on, uh, down the stream. And I'm looking at all of our team up there. But let, me, let me tell you. Let me ask you a question. Come on. You know, you know the answer to this. What happened after I jumped? They all jumped. They all jumped. Every single one of our 20 people jumped after I jumped. But guess what? It took a little kid to show me. Just jump. Just jump. Come on, give Jesus a hand. Amen. Well, I'm going to ask our... I'm going to ask our keyboard player to come. Would you just come and just play something for me? Amen. Listen, can I say this to you guys? I'm going to wrap this up right here, right now. Listen, in God, you're going to have to jump. You're going to have to jump when you just don't know what it looks like. That's why it's called faith. If you knew positively what was going to happen, then that wouldn't be faith. Faith is when you jump. You know, and I'm thinking of even Albert right now. Somebody had to give Albert information about this experimental treatment because the other stuff wasn't working. I mean, he was like, he couldn't. I visited him in the hospital, and he could barely talk. He, could, he couldn't move. It was, he was in so much pain. And so, you know, sometimes you just got to jump, and you just don't know what's, on, what's at the end. And so, this is, so what's the encouragement here? Well, yeah, the encouragement is jump, but I would say this to you. I would say is that when you face crisis, what is the first thing you run to or go to? What is that? What is the first thing that you run to or go to? And I would say to you that if it's not God, you need to, you need to drop to your knees first and go after God. And begin to look up the scriptures that talk about what you're dealing with. Because you may think that everything around you is so big and so massive. And like, how in the world am I going to do this? How am I going to make it through this? I don't know. And it's just having those real conversations with God and saying, you know what? My faith is weak right now. I don't have faith for healing right now. I don't have faith to be able to get out of this financial crisis. I don't have faith right now for, for the restoration of this relationship. I'm praying one thing and they're telling me something else. That's where God kicks in. Because if it was up to you, God wouldn't need to be involved. If it was up to you being a good person, then there would be many miracles taking place. But actually, it's not about you being a good person. It's do you have faith? Do you have faith? And faith is a muscle that you must exercise. A friend of mine, you know, he sent me the picture on the phone and stuff. Um, he told me to pray. You know, one day I'll talk about this, but he told me to pray about a, a situation at his job and a situation uh, with his wife that was getting tests. And he, what the picture was actually a picture of a seed that he wanted to, he, th listen to what he said. He said, Pastor, he goes, I'm sending this to your church. I'm sending this. It was, wasn't no, no huge amount or nothing, but he said, I'm sending this seed to New Dawn because I'm believing for, a, I'm believing for God to move. Now, he wasn't paying for something. He just understands the principle of seed, time, and harvest. When you plant seed in the ground, it multiplies. When you, listen, seed is not only financial. Seed is your prayer. Seed, when you begin to declare God's word, that is seed into the, in, it's going out from the natural into the supernatural. Into the supernatural. And by the way, my friend got great reports on both situations. But, but, but here's what I want to say to you. 
is that it's time for us to jump. It's time for us to step out into the unknown, step out into the deep. I appreciate our worship ministry today just taking us to another place and taking us deeper and just pressing in. Listen, y'all, you got to press into God. Well, pastor, no, that's works now. No, it's not. It's faith to press into God. Do you know how, look, I'm, I'm going to, I can keep going with this. I'm going to finish with this. Do you know how much information that has not, has nothing to do with God that all of you are bombarded with on a daily basis? Think about that for a moment. How much information that is godless, that is impure, that has nothing to do with faith that you are bombarded with. Why do you think you have to press? Because you have to clear all that junk away from you and get it off and say, I'm going to go after the mind of God. You have to go after it. And it's going to take pressing in. And it's not a comfortable message. Because there's a lot of people that tell you that you can just do stuff with very little effort. Listen, Zacchaeus climbed the tree. The paralyzed man's friends literally climbed high, broke open a roof to lower this man to where Jesus was. Sometimes you're going to have to go on a fast. Sometimes you're going to have to call people that you don't want to call and say, I need prayer. Sometimes you're going to have to search the scriptures, not just one. You're going to have to maybe search 20. Some of you are going to have to search 50 until you get faith in your spirit for an area. Don't stop. Get faith in your heart. A friend of ours, they said, uh, 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 a pastor friend, they told him his baby was dead. And he said that when he started praying the first two hours, he did not have faith. But something happened on hour three where at the edge of his bed, he began to believe that God is able to bring his son back to life. And in hour four, he began to say, I thank you, God, that my son is alive. I speak, I thank you that he's alive. And when they went back the next morning before they did a DNC on his wife, they found a heartbeat. His son is alive and preaching today. But hour one and two, you say hour one and two? Well, do you watch a movie for two hours? I know I do. But he said hour one and two, he didn't believe. But hour three, when he started going over those healing scriptures, my son will live and not die. My son will live and not die. My son will live and not die. He started getting it in his spirit. Albert, it's time to press, brother. It's time to press. Don't be throwing up no little rinky-dink stuff like, God, I know you can. No, no, no. You need to, you need to get to a place where, God, I know you will. I am. Come on now. I'm talking about that's... That's a life and death situation right there. You see what I'm saying? It's not time to play around. It's time to really press in. Some of you can go into an area and pray it and it happens quickly. That's cool. But a lot of times we don't have faith for something. We're facing a challenge and you have to press in. I want you to stand to your feet. Let me pray for you real quick. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just come before you. And we just thank you right now in this moment that there's faith in this place. God, you were so faithful even at the beginning of worship to release an atmosphere of healing and faith as we were worshiping. So, Father, right now we just, just come before you and ask in the mighty name of Jesus that you would just put in our heart, put in our spirit that it's time to jump. It's time to jump. It's time to jump into the unknown. It's time to jump. And it's not about what if God doesn't. It's about what if God does. What if God does? So, Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the story of the paralyzed man, that his friends had enough faith. When they broke open that roof, the Bible says Jesus looked at their faith.
He looked at their faith and Jesus was moved by their faith. So, Father, everyone in this place, it's time to get bigger faith. It's time to get stronger faith. It's time to open ourselves up and say, God, I'm not satisfied with the faith that I have. I'm not satisfied with regular faith. I'm not satisfied with crowd faith. I need the tree faith. I need to climb in the tree faith. I need to climb up to the rocks kind of faith and just jump. So, Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord. We will believe you. We will believe you. If you're here in this place, you say, Pastor Irwin, I do believe in God, but to be honest with you, Pastor, I've not surrendered my life to him. I do believe.